This week, to be closer to China, China is now the largest renewable energy market in the world. Its electricity production from renewables doubles that of the United States. Yet, China's energy needs are so large that renewable supply only about one quarter of the country's total power generation. How has China built its solar industry, and what are its current challenges? 二零一四年，习近平总书记提出能源生产和消费革命重要论述。呃，我们国家的能源发展战略就是要朝向清洁低碳、安全高效的能源体系这个方向发展。Government support has driven renewable energy development, but it has also led to overcapacity and trade tensions. Should government support be cut? 但是这种突然间的这种下调的话呢，它的问题是很大，就是你预期给的很高，但现实当中你没给那么多，就造成了这个这个投资前面过热，后边又找不到市场。This week, follow China's solar energy to be closer to China. I'm reading scare headlines in the international media about China's aspirations in green energy. China assuming the mantle of leadership of green energy. China on track to lead in renewables as U.S. retreats. China wants to dominate the world's green energy markets. Is something bad happening? Is this a cause for alarm? Well, think about it. What's so bad about leading green energy, which will make the world economy more sustainable? What's so alarming about competition to save the planet? The world is unsustainable. Rampant pollution is causing untold illnesses, incurring incalculable costs. Climate change will devastate the planet, inundating coastal cities, evaporating trillions of dollars from world GDP. China is dedicating enormous resources to developing alternative energy. Take solar energy. China has become the world's largest market for photovoltaics and solar thermal energy. Since 2013, China has been the world's leading installer of solar. By the end of 2018, China's installed solar capacity was about 170 gigawatts. How has China built its solar industry, and what are its current challenges? In particular, government subsidies have driven development. But government subsidies lead to overcapacity and trade tensions. Should government subsidies be cut? Follow solar energy to be closer to China. China's 13 five-year plan, 2016 to 2020, promotes a more service-oriented, diversified, and less carbon-intensive economy. The plan reflects China's ambition to create a low-carbon future with reduced air pollution from fossil fuels. According to the World Economic Forum, in 2017, China ranked first in renewable energy investment, accounting for nearly half of the global total. While investment fell by 6% in the U.S. and 36% in Europe, China increased its investment by 58%. Why does China allocate such resources to alternative energy? What kind of supporting policies does China have to develop its alternative energy industries? In 2014, President Xi Jinping proposed a revolution in energy production and consumption. China's energy development strategy calls for a modern energy system that's clean, low carbon, safe, and efficient. In recent years, China has spearheaded the global solar power industry, thanks mainly to state laws and policies that support renewable energy, as well as improving its management. We have set up a relatively comprehensive industrial system in terms of photovoltaic cells and PV modules for manufacturing. China enjoys tangible strength in terms of PV power, as it accounts for 68 percent of global production. China is really a champion of the Sustainable Development Goals, both domestically but internationally. China was one of the first countries reporting back to the international community on their commitment 
and implementation plan of the Sustainable Development Goals and also in terms of monitoring how, how they are being achieved. Renewable energy is really at the core of achieving a lot of the goals. So I really believe that China adapted that view. And if we look through back the 11th, 12th, and 13th five-year plan, we can see the difference. We can see that in the 13th five-year plan, renewable energy and the whole sustainability agenda is at the core of China's commitment and China's plans on, on, on uh, the priorities for, for the country. Why does the Chinese government devote so much resources to developing alternative energy? Coal has long dominated China's energy mix and continues to dominate it today. In fact, our current environmental challenges with smog and many other issues is directly related to our huge consumption of coal. Fossil fuels, particularly coal, comprise the lion's share of China's current energy mix. However, to improve this situation and as part of our prioritizing of environmental protection, we must reduce our dependence on coal consumption. Oil and natural gas are not preferable alternatives because for China, energy security is equally important to environmental environmental protection. Still, we want to be less dependent on imported oil and natural gas as well, so we must find other ways out. To alter the current energy landscape, the Chinese government has set its sights on wind and solar energy, hoping to develop them significantly enough to not only replace coal, but to satisfy our overall energy demands. We're aware of the cost issue and many other industry-related problems but we must seek alternative energies. There is no choice. Solar energy is among the cleanest and the most natural forms of energy, and its development is essential for meeting China's energy and climate goals, especially in reducing reliance on high emissions coal. According to the China Photovoltaic Industry Association, China's installed capacity of solar power generation reached 170 gigawatts in 2018, among which the newly installed capacity was about 43 gigawatts. Today, five of the world's six top solar module manufacturers are Chinese. And the target for total solar capacity in China's 13th five-year plan was hit by April 2018 at 140 gigawatts. However, the state subsidies required for such large-scale solar growth has become an increasing burden on the national budget. Though the cost of solar energy has been dropping, it still remains generally more expensive than fossil fuels. And concerns are mounting over the intensified risk of solar overcapacity in China. What are the specific elements that compose a complete solar energy system and about how much does each cost relatively? Today's overall costs for the PV industry are dramatically lower. Compared with a decade ago, it's nearly a tenfold decrease. The costs we generally discuss refer to the expense of power generation, as well as the cost to get that energy on grid, then sold to consumers. In other words, such energy requires on-grid transmission in order to reach tens of thousands of households. However, the nosedive in costs, which now enables PV to compete with thermal power in some places, actually refers to the cost of getting on grid. At later stages, though, the costs for PV are much higher than those of thermal power. Indeed, the transmission of delivery costs of PV are actually much higher than that of thermal power, which remains a stable source of power generation as long as coal is in supply. PV power, however, also depends on sunlight. For every one degree of electricity produced, there must be a consumer ready to utilize it. Otherwise, the energy would be wasted because PV power cannot be stored, at least not for now. From the perspective of an entire industrial chain, the cost of thermal power today is significantly lower than that of PV. This fact has caused confusion for PV policymakers. It was the solar industry that first raised the so-called affordable on-grid price, which is said to be competitive with thermal power. But on second thought, if PV can truly compete with thermal power, then why would the government subsidize PV? 
Thermal power is given no such subsidy. Simply put, while the on-grid costs for PV and thermal power may be similar, the transmission cost of PV remains much higher than that of thermal power. There are other issues here after years of new energy development, like basic facilities constructions lagging behind schedule. How does China solve these problems? In the large-scale development of renewable energy, infrastructure is occasionally incompatible when uniting power transmission, operation and systems, including peak shaving facilities. China has taken measures to facilitate the coordination of different energy types to ensure that energy infrastructure better serves the growth of renewable energy. For example, in recent years, we've enhanced the flexibility of coal-fired power units to bolster the peak shaving capacity of renewable energy and to carve out a larger share of the market. We also built more pumped storage hydroelectric plants as a way to enhance peak shaving capacity. In addition, energy conservation, flexible power consumption and other measures have made the whole system more suitable to extensively exploit renewable energy. This process requires the harmonization of technologies, institutional patterns and market mechanisms. Only then can a balanced, sustainable new type of energy system take shape. On the whole, the pricing pressure of solar photovoltaics leads to overcapacity and oversupply. How does the Chinese government resolve these problems? Amid the rapid growth of renewable energy, some regions have seen the development of large-scale wind and PV power projects. They also step up efforts to encourage local consumption, as well as the building of transmission channels to expand the reach of wind and PV power across wider areas. A broader consumption area indicates greater market potential. In recent years, the National Development and Reform Commission, together with the National Energy Administration, have taken a series of measures to absorb PV power. To further bolster the industry, Grid enterprises like the State Grid Corporation of China and the China Southern Power Grid have adopted technological measures to support PV. For example, one major move has been to build transmission channels for PV transportation. Another approach is market trading. On the one hand, large-scale industrial enterprises conduct transactions of local electricity to enhance consumption of renewable energy. On the other hand, power reforms resulted in a new market mechanism which fueled cross-province power trading. Thus, we're exploring more channels to absorb renewable energy which drives up the usage rate of PV power. China may have very good technology to uh, replace renewable energy, um, but a lot of the times this, there is a barrier to the market entry. The biggest challenge is the requirement of upfront capital investments. So for example, if a new technology is developed to desalinate water using renewable energy or actually just uh, solar power, uh, the technology is there, but the upfront investment to create this as, at a scale, as an industry, as a sector, requires a lot of investments. How we can promote this upfront investment putting it into the scale of a long-term vision where we see that there will be a return on the investment, but at the same time still somebody has to pay for it. So it either has to come through subsidies, it either has to come through investors who see the long-term possibility, or it will be recovered through, through the consumers. But these are some of the examples where we need to be, work very closely with the private sector and with governments so that we find a solution to take these technologies to market. In May 2018, the Chinese government announced it would cut financial subsidies in the solar sector in order to control the breakneck growth in the industry. Industry players expressed their deep concerns over the sudden reduction, including a direct appeal to President Xi Jinping during his meeting with private business leaders in November. No one thought it a coincidence that the very next day, the government regulator, the National Energy Administration, announced an easing of the cuts. What motivated the initial move to reduce subsidies? 
And why did the government change its policy after the industries lobbied? A new policy was released in May 2018 that the Chinese government will cut subsidies for the solar industry. Why is the Chinese government putting a break on subsidies and what would be the likely impact? The rapid development of renewable energy has indeed brought multiple challenges to the entire power system. In fact, it demands adjustments from both sides. The rapid growth of renewable energy poses a daunting burden for subsidies. However, as the costs of wind and PV power gradually decline, the estimate is that in around two years, newly built PV projects will no longer need subsidies. Their costs, too, will keep lowering. From a long-term perspective, the development of new energy, including PV power, will bring positive social effects for society, as ordinary Chinese should pay less for utilities like electricity. It's necessary and worthwhile to grant subsidies in the very beginning. If you consider the added value and long-term social returns that justifies the high absolute figure of today's subsidy, it's a significant part of China's energy revolution. Around the corner, we can expect a cut in subsidies for PV power once renewable energy grows in scale. Finally, it would embrace marketization and no more state subsidy. During this process, as the subsidy is gradually cut, the new PV projects that bid for approval should expect less dependence on that state subsidy. This means increased competitiveness for renewable energy technology and fuels greater development potential down the road. Why did several solar companies experience severe financial problems some years ago driven by overcapacity? Do government subsidies cause market distortions or are there other reasons? I don't believe it was government subsidies alone that led to such problems. Government subsidies were intended to be that strong. The downside, though, is if we fail to slash those subsidies promptly as soon as related costs drop. Moreover, investors weren't given clear signals that they should expect the subsidies cut. In theory, a reduction in PV costs can be clearly calculated in advance. If the government informs investors that a subsidy will be cut gradually, for example, if cost reductions are expected over three years, then a subsidy will be slashed accordingly each of those years, then investors would not react so aggressively with heavier investments. We now see an influx of investors and their investments joining the seemingly lucrative PV industry. In fact, the government intends to lower the electricity price, even though they've yet to announce it. For some investors who seek financing, though, they deliberately choose to ignore this trend. Surely there are imprudent investors, but I believe a majority of them just pretend to be unaware of the trend. Thus, a large amount of capital has become pooled in the PV industry, which people believe will become a cash cow, featuring a stable price and costs that continually drop. In my opinion, overcapacity in PV, wind, and solar power is directly linked to investors misunderstanding the subsidy policy or to the government's failure to disclose the subsidy cut. I hope our government would be wiser going forward. For example, it's perfectly reasonable to lower the price since subsidies were given at a time of high costs. However, it doesn't make sense to grant huge subsidies after those costs start declining. Moreover, a sudden cost if unexpected by investors, would also be problematic. Aggressive investors would find it much harder to decide how to invest wisely. After the policy release, Liu Hanyuan, head of solar panel manufacturer Tongwei Group, was invited to President Xi Jinping's sit-down with private businesses on November 1, 2018. Liu told Xi that cutting subsidies would tank his business, and the next day, Industry players saw an easing of the new regulation. People realized that industry lobbying plays a bigger part in policy making than they had imagined. What's your opinion? It's supposed to be like this, and I hope entrepreneurs will enjoy a greater say in such matters going forward. Why? Because private enterprises are in a difficult position when competing in our energy sector. 
they only have limited access to PV, photovoltaic cells, and electric vehicles, yet they have no access to the oil industry, for example, which is all state-owned. How can any private enterprise compete with the China National Petroleum Corporation? Established, efficient, state-owned enterprises already exist and generate all types of energy. For private enterprises to compete with such SOEs, especially in the energy sector, it'd be like an egg that smashes itself against a rock. In this sense, private enterprises find it difficult to compete in the energy sector. I hope they will be given a greater say in their communications with the government. If wiser enterprises and the government can engage in better communications, I believe the energy sector will embark on a track of healthier growth. China's 13th five-year plan, 2016 to 2020, presents detailed targets for the energy sector, including, by 2020, a 15% goal for the share of non-fossil energy of overall energy consumption, as well as accelerating technological innovation and energy transformation. What is China's strategy for energy transformation? How to boost the development of China's alternative energy industry? The core motivation for energy transformation in Germany is air and environmental protection. In the U.S., it's energy security. What is China's current strategy for energy transformation? For China, energy security serves as a core strategy. In general, when we talk about clean power, low carbon, transformation, or any related issues, deep down, it's truly the energy security that comes first. We do have a problem with our exceptionally high consumption of coal, especially with the smog it produces. We can hardly address that, though, without slashing coal consumption. The current strategy for China to achieve greater energy security is to diversify our energy mix and focus more on developing alternative energy. In line with this strategy, we'll continue to facilitate the growth of wind and PV power. Can you project the possible future direction of China's solar industry, in specific and also in general, for China's whole alternative energy industry? For China to build a relatively green energy system, we must make breakthroughs in energy storage. We now have available energy storage technologies, which are economical to some extent. But to implement their large-scale use, we need technological breakthroughs, which will allow for greater quantity and more affordable costs. Think about it. Many of the new varieties of energy that we're developing directly involve energy capture. Take wind power, for example. Today, we can only use wind power when there's actually wind. But if we have the means to store it, we could capture the wind power when there's wind, then unleash that power when the wind stops, right? The same applies to solar power. With a storage system in place, we could store solar power when the sun is out and release that power when it's not. I would say the most important thing is to find the right mix. Because when we're looking at renewable energy in China and beyond, um, there's solar energy, wind energy, biomass, hydrogen, and so forth. But they all have their particularities in terms of uh, where and how they can use the uh, renewable sources for energy, how these can be transmitted, and how these can be made available for actual electricity use for people. What should be done to develop China's solar industry? Any suggestions? Investors must have reasonable expectations if we hope to contain overcapacity. In terms of subsidy design, I suggest we focus more on upstream industries of the solar power sector. We now subsidize downstream sectors, namely the electricity generated. There's nothing wrong with that since the price is quite clear, but it's not the wisest option. Take electric vehicles as an example. Subsidies are given to produce such vehicles regardless of whether they're of good quality or bad, as long as they meet specifications and can run on the road. What message does that deliver? That enterprises should focus on quantity, not quality. For a significant number of these subsidies, the manufacturers may somehow collude with sellers directly by offering car shells, not an entire car, then split the subsidy. To summarize this issue, first, there's an inclination to focus on quantity over quality, 
then the subsidy itself may be swindled. New energy depends on constantly improving and upgrading technologies. These technological advances should lead to a steady lowering of costs which are reliable and sustainable. What do you think is the biggest opportunity, the biggest challenge for the development of China's alternative energy? What's China's developmental goal for the year 2050? Renewable energy is presented with a great opportunity. Global concerns about climate change demand the reduced consumption of carbon-intensive energy. As the costs of renewable energy continue to drop, all countries appear ready to prioritize the development of renewable energy. In that case, we're able to tap into a global market with huge potential. From a policy perspective, renewable energy may face many hurdles within a pure market mechanism. Many countries prioritize renewable energy to go on grid, offer a guaranteed purchase of the electricity generated by renewable energy resources, or they enforce minimum market shares of renewable energy sources, the so-called quota scheme. China is studying the feasibility of its renewable energy quota scheme and preparing to implement it. That is to say, a certain percentage of power must come from renewable energy. Thus, consumers and power utilities would see that we prioritize renewable energy consumption. Such market mechanisms would lay a solid foundation for the growth of renewable energy and guide our energy system along the track of green, low-carbon development. One is, of course, how it operates in terms of an incentive systems and in terms of the pricing and, and, and access. And China has gone through various policy modifications for that and uh, transitioning from a feed-in tariff system to a quota system, for example. At the same time, there's also challenges um, regarding to how the technology is able to keep up with the, with the needs of, of the sector. A lot of the time they quote, experts quote, uh, the siting and the transmission of renewable energy solutions, which of course is a global barrier. But I believe China being the, the international hub for innovation and technology, if we put together China's ability to innovate and create the technology needed and China's commitment to scale up renewable energy solutions, I believe that in a few years we will see a, a major breakthroughs in China. China has overtaken the U.S. and Germany to become the number one exporter of solar goods and services. A decade ago, China accounted for less than 1% of the world's solar capacity. By the end of 2017, it accounted for one-third. In 2017 alone, China added more solar capacity than the total solar capacity of any other country. China's announcement in May 2018 to cut government subsidies of solar was designed to reduce overcapacity and rationalize the market. And perhaps in the trade war with the U.S., signal that Chinese solar panel makers would no longer undercut U.S. manufacturers. But after the outcry from China's solar industry, the subsidies were extended to 2022. Broadly speaking, solar exemplifies two policy-making concepts in China. The first is how the government has become sensitive to feedback from key constituencies and solicits opinions and advice from experts. The second is the role of government subsidies in developing new technologies. Because solar is critical for sustainable development and for controlling pollution, and because solar technologies are still not profitable, government subsidies are required to develop the industry and to enable research. Yet all recognize the trade-off that subsidies create market distortions and exacerbate trade tensions. Although fossil energy will remain the main energy source through mid-century, in the long term, solar, as the ultimate renewable, will dominate. The challenge is the short term. Watch solar to keep closer to China.